Sono Sara Agostini, dirigente scolastica dell'Istituto Copernico Pasoli, che ha l'onore ancora una volta di ospitare un incontro per uh, i ragazzi eh, di quelli indimenticabili. Uh, un incontro formativo di quelli che non ha proprio eguali, quindi in questi casi tento sempre di non far perdere tempo in modo da far parlare i nostri relatori. Oggi devo ringraziare la professoressa Galletta, nostra collaboratrice, perché eh, è organizzatrice instancabile di questi incontri. Il professor Roberto Fattore, dirigente scolastico del liceo eh, Maffei, a cui tra poco passerò la parola, eh, che ha reso possibile in realtà concretamente questo incontro. Incontro eh, che ci rende particolarmente orgogliosi in quanto non capita tutti i giorni di avere questo grande onore di un premio Nobel che sia disponibile ad incontrare i nostri ragazzi, quindi ringrazio Erwin Neher, Neher il bio, biofisico tedesco, ma c'è chi meglio di me lo potrà introdurre perché ringrazio la professoressa Flaminia Maltrezzi di essere qui con noi e, e che ci potrà introdurre meglio negli argomenti. Eh, buona mattinata a tutti e passo la parola al professor Fattore. Bene, buongiorno. Anche da parte mia un saluto a tutte e tutti i partecipanti e ovviamente rinnovo i ringraziamenti appena espressi dalla collega la dirigente Sara Agostini. Quindi di nuovo grazie alla rete STEI. Eh, alla professoressa Galletta, alla professoressa Maldezzi e ovviamente al nostro prestigiosissimo ospite, il eh, professor Ner. E ringrazio anche tutti gli studenti e le studentesse che si sono coinvolti in questa mattinata, che hanno già <coughs> proposto delle domande e quindi davvero tutto qui. Eh, buona mattinata davvero per questa interessantissima iniziativa. Lascio quindi subito la parola alla professoressa Maldezzi che eh, appunto introdurrà ancora in maniera più precisa e puntuale eh, l'argomento della mattinata. Grazie ancora a tutti e a tutte. Grazie. E, beh, intanto io ringrazio tantissimo eh, in italiano, ma adesso partiamo con l'inglese, eh, la rete STEI e, e dopo magari il professor Marco Costanzi che eh, darà qualche aggiornamento sulle attività scientifiche della rete STEI come eh, diciamo coordinatore della parte scientifica. Uh, so I'm particularly pleased and happy to have with us Professor Neher. He's uh, Emeritus Director at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry and Max Planck Institute for Uh, multidisciplinary sciences. He is a physicist, he graduated in physics um, and then uh, did a PhD in physics specializing in biophysics and uh, bioelectricity. Uh, he, is, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in uh, 1991 for his uh, revolution, revolutionary uh, research on ion channels and developing the technique of patch clamp uh, about which we are going to talk today. Um, well, uh, I would like to uh, really thank Professor Nair. His studies uh, had a great impact on many scientific areas uh, and uh, on a lot of pathologies and so on the study, a lot of pathologies like uh, cystic fibrosis and Alzheimer's disease and uh, many others, we are going to talk about that today. So a great impact on the science, um, in, on, on many science areas. Uh, well, uh, Professor Nair, we are here today with many students and many of them are in the process of choosing and making a decision for their future career. So the first thing I would like to ask you, and maybe we can talk about this a bit, how did you uh, start? I mean, what was uh, your idea at first? How did you choose biophysics and uh, bioelectricity? Uh, the, yeah. <laughs> we can't hear right now, okay. No, no, okay, okay, buongiorno. <laughs> A little bit of Italian, but unfortunately not enough to answer you in Italian. So, um, 
Thank you for the invitation uh, to contribute here. Uh, regarding your first question, uh, how did I decide to study or try to study biophysics and become a biophysicist? Well, this was an interest which already developed during high school time, you know, when uh, uh, in the early 1960s, uh, as a high school student, I learned about uh, bioelectricity, the fact that there is electricity in our body, you know, and then I have been interested all over in um, uh, technical things, el uh, electricity, and so I was fascinated by the idea that there is electricity in the body, and I wanted to know more about that, and so decided that I wanted to study biophysics. But of course, at that time, biophysics was not a discipline which was taught at the university, so I had to decide, do I want to start with physics or do I want to start with biology with the aim of uh, trying to get into research about bioelectricity? And I decided to start with physics, you know, and I think this was uh, uh, was a good 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 decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Um, well, we share this, you know, because I graduated in physics and then specialized in biophysics, and uh, it was later on, and uh, I graduated in '97, so uh, you were just had been awarded with Nobel Prize. And I started uh, studying Pach Klam, thanks to you, of course. And so I can understand, and maybe the um, interesting thing for students here is that you kind of find, find, found a way out to uh, reach your goal. So your um, final destination, bioelectricity. And uh, so you started um, then uh, entering the world of bioelectricity. And what are the key experiments or what happened that uh, brought you to study the ion channels and mm -hmm. then to the patch clamp technique? Yeah, well, I mean, the state of knowledge uh, when I entered university or later when I uh, started a thesis to get a doctoral degree. The state of knowledge was based on the theory by Hodgkin and Huxley, you know, who in 1952 published uh, some very interesting papers explaining how the nerve impulse comes about. Their study was done on the giant nerve fiber of the squid, the calamari, you know. Calamari, uh, yeah which is a kind of tube-like structure, um, um, a very large uh, nerve fiber, which of course is a kind of cylinder of membrane um, in which you can insert longitudinally uh, wires. And Hodgkin Huxley did these experiments and found out that uh, the reason why an action potential and nerve impulse happens is that the membrane becomes permeable for a short while, uh, specifically for some ions. So uh, it becomes uh, permeable first uh, to sodium ions, which rush inward and make the inside positive, you know, followed by uh, membrane becoming permeable to potassium, um, which uh, then uh, causes outward currents. And so the big question was, why does the membrane become permeable? What is the mechanism, you know? Hodgkin and Huxley already proposed that there may be gates which open and close for ions to uh, uh, flow. And uh, this was a dominating question in the 1960s, you know, 60s, uh, uh, 70s. What, what is the mechanism of these Gates, you know, do that such pores which are gated actually exist? And uh, we decided that we would try to prove the Hodgkin Huxley theory by trying to measure currents at very high resolution to see step like changes in current when these gates open and close. Very okay. simple idea. 
Uh, thank you. If you don't mind, I would translate just a little yeah. bit of what you yeah. said so that I'm sure that all the students that are around the classrooms uh, can understand this, I mean, this point, because it's, it's the very start of everything I'd say. Uh, il professore ha detto che stava lavorando, che ha, uh, ha preso dei risultati che erano stati ottenuti sul squid, che è il calamaro appunto, uh, in cui si era visto che le membrane delle cellule diventano impermeabili agli ioni, cioè eh, permeabili agli ioni, cioè lasciano passare insomma degli ioni, gli ioni sono di fatto cariche elettriche, quindi un passaggio di ione significa che sta passando della corrente ed era stato misurato questo action potential, quindi questo passaggio di corrente, e, e c'era quindi una permeabilità delle membrane al passaggio degli ioni. Eh, era stata misurata e la, la grande domanda, the big question was why, perché eh, diciamo, le membrane cellulari sono eh, permeabili al passaggio degli ioni. Uh, thank you very much. So, <laughs> you, you mentioned calamari. Calamari, I, of course, yeah. I, I should mention that indeed on the way to... Uh, Uh, establishing this technique. Uh, I spent uh, uh, several months in Italy, in Camoli, at the uh, um, uh, marine laboratory there, which oh, is... Camoli in, uh, in Liguria. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, and there we were working together with Professor Franco Conti uh, on these calamari, on the squid uh, 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 giant axons, trying to approach the membrane from the inside, you know, and trying to measure current. And in fact, the first publication of step-like changes in current were based on these measurements in Camoli. Lovely. And so, uh, can you describe the technique at this point? Because what, what happened was that you uh, were trying to find a way to understand the current across the membranes And so you came up with an idea, right? Yes, the idea was a very simple one, you know. Oh, yeah. If you want to try to measure these very small currents, um, uh, it's probably not a good idea to measure currents across the membrane of a whole cell, you know. Somehow you needed a biological preparation and the typical biological preparations are cells And then the technique was to stick electrodes inside the cell and measure currents between inside and outside. So, but um, to that whole th cell current measurement, of course, many, many channels contribute. And so our idea was to isolate a small patch of membrane uh, by placing a pipette onto the surface of the cell, trying to isolate The, for the purpose of the electrical measurement, this little patch of membrane with the idea that on this patch there may be only a few channels, you know, that uh, if you do it right, you may be able to measure the current from this small patch in very high resolution and so should be able to see these uh, step-like changes in current. Yes, so we have uh, a slide here about ion channels. So ion channels are through the cell membranes. This was what was coming out those years, right? And so the idea um, Professor Nair explained was uh, he had the idea to isolate a single channel. So take a patch of the cell membrane. Uh, la tecnica sperimentale che lui ha scoperto, uh, la vediamo poi nella slide successiva, si chiama patch clamp e patch significa proprio toppa, quindi la sua idea era di riuscire a prendere, eccola lì, un pezzettino uh, della membrana cellulare e isolare il canale. So here it is the patch clamp technique. Uh, did it take a while to make it work? Uh... It actually did not take so long. I mean, we did try preliminary experiments already during my PhD thesis, uh, work in the uh, uh, late 1960s. But then when we started the project in Göttingen, again, together with Bert Sackmann, uh, when we were both postdocs, uh, this was around 1973. And uh, during 75, um, uh, One second, um, yes. During uh, 73, 74, 
we got the very first um, recordings which convinced us that these are uh, signs of ion channels uh, opening and closing. Uh, it then took, however, another four years until 1980 uh, when we um, uh, um, made the real breakthrough in the technique by being able to achieve this very tight seal, uh, what we call it, a very tight connection between the measuring pipette and the underlying membrane. You know? So total about six, seven years, but uh, with steps in between, which already were partial successes. Because if I understand well, um, you uh, had to deal with the fact that uh, you had to isolate a single channel, so you needed to be, you needed to, a, a very small patch of the cell membrane, and um, that that was the most difficult part, I think, I don't know. The, the most difficult thing was to obtain a good seal, a good contact between okay. the membrane, you know, because uh, usually cell surfaces are covered with um, uh, material, so you need a clean surface, and you have to find a way that the, mem uh, the pipette, which is made from glass, uh, really uh, makes a good contact with the underlying membrane. And, and uh, I mean, the, the breakthrough really was a chance observation that you need a number of conditions. You need a very clean surface. You need a very clean uh, uh, pipette. You have to apply a little bit of uh, pressure to, uh, um, in the pipette in order to secure an outflow of membrane uh, of material while you approach the cell, you know, and that by chance happened uh, around 19 January 1980 that in a few experiments all these conditions were met and we suddenly got this very large increase in or improvement in the contact which in the experiment is recognized by an increase in the resistance, electrical resistance between the inside of the pipette and the outside uh, medium, you know. And so this was was chance, and um, but it was essential for the further applicability of the technique. Yes, yeah, so I will shortly, shortly translate it. And I also would like to mention, because I course, right? Something that uh, the currents, this is something students can really understand, are very small, so picoamperes. Um, quindi il professore diceva che uh, la cosa più difficile in assoluto è stata a riuscire ad avere una buona aderenza tra la pipetta e la membrana cellulare, perché chiaramente viene isolata una parte piccolissima di membrana cellulare, ma il problema maggiore che lui ha dovuto affrontare e superare è stata la questione dell'aderenza della pipetta alla membrana cellulare. Le correnti in gioco sono dell'ordine di pico ampere, per cui 10 alla meno 12 ampere, considerando che le correnti di casa sono dell'ordine dell'ampere, chiaramente sono segnali piccolissimi che sono, che, insomma, sono stati cercati. Uh, so, and then here we come to the Nobel, Nobel Prize Award for the patch clamp technique. And this has changed the many aspects of uh, ion, well, it's, it, it is a revolution in the field of ion channels. Your uh, discovery together with Bert Sackman of the, of the punch, patch clamp technique. Uh, would, would you tell us what scientific areas, at least a part of them, because I think there are many, really many scientific areas that have been um, touched and got an impact from what you discovered, but what are the main scientific areas you would like to mention to us and to students that uh, could benefit from your discovery? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, of course, the experiments were based on so-called electrophysiology, the um, um, uh, uh, goal of understanding the function of cells, particularly neurons, you know, uh, on the basis of, of physiological or of, of physical, physical laws, you know. And in a way, 
the patched lamp revolutionized electrophysiology because before patched lamp researchers had to use the biggest cells that can be found in the biological world uh, which were which tolerated the insertion of microelectrodes into them to be to be penetrated by microelectrodes you know and uh, with the patched lamp the measurement on a small on a small uh, um, patch and particularly uh, the measurement um, another variation of the measurement which could record with similar or comparable uh, resolution also from small cells made it possible to concentrate the efforts on small cells and it happens that in our body uh, most of the cells are very small so it the technique opened up the electrophysiological study to a whole range of uh, cells of mechanisms which were important for understanding human physiology you know and not uh, squid phys physiology not you know? squid physiology <laughs> 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 yeah. not um, so this was the immediate effect uh, then of course uh, you have to uh, mention pharmacology because many of the drugs which we have been using and which we uh, use now are based on their action on iron channels either by blocking them by blocking them or by um, 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 uh, activating them you know and indeed quite a number of drugs have been developed um, on the basis of knowledge derived from um, um, a, a patch lamp you know and uh, in a wider sense and I mean modern biology modern molecular biology of course um, tries to understand uh, biological processes on the basis of the action of molecules and there we have a huge cosmos say of signaling molecules including ion channels including receptors for um, uh, hormones of, um, uh, including transcription factors all these uh, uh, mechanisms of how our body is regulated how healing uh, occurs how uh, the immune uh, response occurs uh, all is based on knowledge on all this signaling mechanisms signaling molecules and ion channels are an important uh, thing of it if we if we if we say about uh, ion channels they act on everything that's of course true but they act together with all these other uh, signaling molecules which uh, have been found during the last 20, 30, 40 years, you know, and which can be studied, at least the ion channel part of it, by patch lab. Thank you. Thank you. And um, there, is there is a question now, now from uh, Julia about a particular application of the technique. Uh, Julia is just beside me and yeah. Uh, Good morning, Professor. Hello, hello. It's a pleasure meeting you, and uh, I've been amazed by the technique and the, the, the knowledge you represent for uh, medicine and, of course, uh, uh, drugs and uh, treatments for uh, some kind of uh, specific diseases. Uh, in particular, I'd like to ask you about uh, the um, drug uh, memantine, which uh, is uh, currently used uh, to temporarily slow uh, the uh, neural uh, degeneration caused by Alzheimer's disease. And um, I wanted to ask if uh, the uh, NMDA uh, receptor antagonist is still uh, researched in order to uh, completely find a cure for Alzheimer's or uh, there are new pathways in order to um, find a cure for this disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, memantine is not a cure for Alzheimer's, you know. It's a uh, early example of a drug developed on the basis of uh, knowledge about ion channels, which uh, was found out to ameliorate the symptoms, you know, just to make life a little bit 
easier for people uh, inflicted with Alzheimer's disease. It is a so-called NMDA receptor antagonist, which you mentioned, you know, I mean, um, uh, NM NMDA receptors are uh, one kind of so-called glutamate receptors. Glutamate is the most important excitatory transmitter in the brain, you know, by which uh, one neuron uh, stimulates uh, another neuron. Uh, there are certain subtypes of, uh, of glutamate receptors, and it is this NMDA receptor which has very important roles, uh, particular in the context of synaptic plasticity, the fact that our connections in the brain constantly change, you know, um, 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 with the kind of usage, use-dependent changes in, in, in synaptic transmission. So, um, glutamate receptors, particularly the NMDA receptor, is very important for understanding these mechanisms, you know, and it turned out that it is uh, just by, I mean, empirical, uh, by um, 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 just chance findings that it helps patients cope with um, Alzheimer's disease, but why mode of action actually is not known. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I think there is another question from Copernico Pazzoli. Yes, Daniela. Vittoria is here. Um, good morning, professor, and good morning, everyone in general. I'm Maria Vittoria Sviotto from the high school Copernico Pazzoli, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, two questions um, that are, it's, actually it's one, but uh, you probably, I will ask two questions, but they are about the same theme. And the first one is that uh, you won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1991, and I wanted to ask if you're, um, how are your discoveries still relevant today, and how uh, which are their uses in today's medicine? Well, I mentioned already uh, that they are important for pharmacology. First of all, in understanding mechanisms of certain pharmaca, you know, I mean, before uh, we discussed the case of memantine, but there are other examples. For instance, there is uh, the drug called Calideco, or uh, also it's also oh. sold under the name Trifacta, and this is a medication which actually cures or uh, greatly um, improves the condition of patients calling from so uh, um, 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 with so-called uh, uh, cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is a disease where secretory processes in the lungs and in the um, uh, um, in, 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 in the glands uh, are are disrupted um, and this is due to uh, a mutation in the so-called CFTR cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator a protein which regulates the flux of chloride across membranes you know and uh, intensive work on this uh, CFTR has uh, led to this, these drugs which interact with the um, uh, receptor and uh, correct the dysfunction which, which is originally caused by a mutation. It's a, it's a hereditary disease, you know. So, uh, that has been very successful um, because before this drug was available, many patients died uh, at early age, uh, uh, didn't actually reach adulthood. And, and with the drug, uh, now a large percentage of patients can be treated. The other aspect um, is that Patch clamp research uh, improves uh, drug safety. You know, many drugs suffer 
from side effects. And um, the possibility, the ability to study the effects of drugs on ion channels turned out to be very important to learn about side effects. You know, and in particular, there is the case of a certain channel in heart cells, in the cells of the heart, um, um, where many drugs induce um, or um, 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 uh, change the action of the heart, you know, uh, uh, by interfering with 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 the channel. And so, um, for drug safety, there is now the ruling by the American Food and Drug Administration that all molecules which are supposed to become drugs, you know, uh, have to be tested against side effects on this channel in the heart cells in order to make sure that no drug becomes available uh, to uh, people, which in the end will cause arrhythmias and other problems with uh, in, in cardiology. So um, uh, that's the second aspect, not only development of new drugs, better understanding of drugs, but also uh, protection against unwanted side effects. Thank you. Uh, yes, we talked with the Rete about cystic fibrosis last year, and Verona is particularly into the, the thing because there is the, the biggest center for the cure of the disease in Italy is in Verona, mm -hmm. and also there is the foundation that uh, researched for new therapies. So we are uh, as uh, at the regional level, level, but of course also at the national level, they're into the. Mm -hmm the subject, yeah. Now I have Tommaso here who have a question for you. Uh, good morning, Professor. Good morning. It's, not, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I only have one question for you. Do you think scientists like you have some ethical responsibilities, referring also to the multiple uses of your project? And in which way are your discoveries using? In which way? What was it at the end? In which way? way are your discoveries using? Used. Yeah. Used. Well, I mean, this, this question, of course, has been um, um, uh, discussed in the, in the previous question. The question about responsibility. Um, well, I mean, of course, uh, what we are doing or what we are trying to do is to better understand the world around us, better understand the laws of nature, you know, and um, I think, in general, that should be a positive effect on how people live, you know, because uh, before the, the, the uh, time of science, say in, in previous centuries, people uh, uh, tried to explain what happened around them by um, beliefs, by faith, by ghosts, by uh, devils, you know, by angels. Um, and uh, this created uh, a lot of fear uh, among people, um, uh, false decisions, and uh, being able to understand your surroundings better on the basis of known laws, I think is a positive effect. This, however, implies, of course, that a better understanding of the laws of nature can also lead to more power in a negative sense, more power in um, um, uh, killing uh, uh, other people, more power in terms of uh, um, um, making well, um, to threatening threatening other people. I mean, it's the old problem of uh, Cain and Abel, uh, you know, uh, having a hammer you can use to uh, um, uh, uh, shape your, your surrounding, to build things, you know, but can be also used to, uh, to kill your brother. Mm -hmm. And um, the question then boils down 
to uh, should we actually stop this endeavor, you know, and um, uh, uh, leave the state of knowledge on, on, on where it is now? Or should we try to, to go on? And uh, the answer to that is basically based on what you think about your fellow um, uh, uh, people. Do you, do you trust that people will use things with knowledge more to the benefit or more to uh, 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 more to destruction? And uh, well, I believe in people in the sense that on average, at least, uh, people will make good use of increased knowledge. But I mean, this is something uh, that, that everybody has to come to grips uh, by, by themselves. Um, when thinking about that, I just remember a uh, word of my high school teacher in um, uh, uh, history, who was uh, very deeply involved in local history of the local little town, you know, and, and he spent much of his time in uh, going through the archives, you know, and trying to find out how uh, people lived in the 16th century in this town or in the 17th century. And he once said that he finds this extremely interesting, you know, what, what happened uh, uh, three, 400 years ago, but uh, uh, taking things together, he wouldn't have liked to live at that time. Well, it's very important what you said, and I'm pleased that everything is recorded because uh, it's worth a reflection on that. Thank you very much. Now, uh, there is Iris from uh, Instituto Copernico Pozzoli, Professor. Good morning, Professor Neher. Good morning. I'm Iris Rolatti from uh, Copernico Pozzoli School, and uh, I have a question for you. Uh, this year, Giorgio Parisi from Italy was awarded the Nobel Prize together with other two scientists. One of them, Klaus Essmann, said he, have, he was feeling like a baby with a, bo a box of chocolate. What do you, did you feel like when you <laughs> were awarded the Nobel Prize? Yeah. And, <laughs> well, that start telling you about my four-year-old daughter or three-year-old daughter at the time, you know, when she heard that daddy has won the Nobel Prize, he thought he would come home with a big bowl of uh, sweets of goodies, you know. Uh, I was just overwhelmed, I would say, you know. Um, of course, um, we have known um, my friend Bert Sackmann and myself, that we have been proposed uh, for the Nobel Prize in the, the years before, but actually at the time when it happened, um, uh, I wasn't prepared for that. And so this announcement then, which comes via telephone, is on the one hand very rewarding, of course, you know, on the other hand, also quite disruptive because uh, as a Nobel laureate, you are exposed to many, many requests from um, people who think that a Nobel Prize winner is good for everything, uh, uh, is good for, uh, uh, say, advising uh, government, is good for, um, uh, uh, but, um, uh, teaching the public, you know, uh, and, and so on. But, of course, a Nobel Prize uh, uh, is not given for special ability in all of these things. It's given for having done a kind of a breakthrough discovery or so, you know, which, which is a very special gift, whether you are able to look at some problem from a new angle and find a new way to, to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just to sum up, I was, of course, very happy, you know, uh, 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 I, I uh, um, uh, 
thought that this Nobel Prize was uh, beneficial for the whole field of research on ion channels and uh, electrophysiology. But on the other hand, of course, it's also uh, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for this contribution. And finally, another question from Julia. Uh, yes, regarding your career, Professor, um, it was a brilliant career, in my opinion. And uh, I'd like to ask you an advice for young adults who want to uh, enter the field of scientific research and medicine. Uh, how we can do it and how we can do it well and how can we succeed? If you mm -hmm. have some tips for us. Yeah, well, I think um, the most important thing of, for, for being a good scientist is that you have to preserve uh, a kind of curiosity. You know, I mean, young children uh, are very curious finding out about the world around them. And this curiosity, the, the, the ability to uh, be uh, uh, captivated by a problem or by a question, you know, so, so that you just keep thinking about this problem this, uh, um, of course, is present at every age, you know, and if you feel that you are the person who really is able to uh, be captivated by, by th these kind of questions, um, then you are probably a good candidate for becoming a scientist. On top of that, you, of course, need certain skills, depending on what kind of science you are going to uh, to uh, to to enter you know i mean in in, in physics in more um, mechanism oriented uh, things you would need some basic uh, knowledge of mathematics some some ability to deal with abstract um, objects in other fields that's not so important for lots of modern molecular biology uh, is based on on uh, well standard try uh, uh, observations tr standard trying to find correlations between uh, things to change in the in the in the environment of an experiment and and the outcome of an experiment you know so uh, this special um, skills let me tell uh, axis depend a lot on on the research field but uh, common to all good scientists is the ability to really get captivated by a given problem you know and and this problem can be either uh, understanding basic laws of uh, nature or else it can be also um, um, a problem of applying knowledge to uh, uh, important uh, uh, problems, important uh, 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 things which have to be achieved, like uh, to convert our use of energy from carbon to renewable energies, you know, or uh, other aspects of uh, climate research. So there are many ways how uh, uh, um, many kinds of problems which may be able to captivate you, you know, but this ability to actually then concentrate on the problem and uh, hardly stop thinking about it, that's what makes a good scientist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, in this uh, contest, is there any field, scientific field, you think that could be prioritized in the f near future? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I'm asking for them because it's their future. Um, so some areas that... Yeah, well, I mean, if I would start a uh, scientific career now, I would probably go into bioinformatics, you know, uh, um, trying, I mean, we have a huge um, repertoire now of data 
um, from uh, um, uh, analysis of the genome, you know, from uh, genomic analysis of uh, diseases, of uh, uh, differences between people and so on. And uh, bioinformatics is the attempt to extract from this huge amount of data uh, useful information, useful information in the sense that it helps you understand how things how things go, you know. Um, but I, I could as well imagine that I would uh, say try to go into more technical aspects of uh, energy uh, uh, research, you know. Or I could imagine that I um, uh, uh, may be caught by a specific important problem in molecular biology. Or, or also, of course, what's uh, on the mind of people, or the, what has been on the mind of people for decades is how the brain works, you know? I mean, I'm, I've spent the last 20, 30 years uh, of my research on trying to find out how neurotransmitter is released and um, uh, what are the laws uh, of this plasticity of neurotransmitter release, which I have mentioned already. You know, but this is uh, uh, neuroscience brain research on the cellular level. Um, even if you know exactly how this works, there is still the other uh, area. How do all these synapses and cells in the, in the brain act together? You know, what are actually the concepts, the basic features of information processing in the brain and, and because uh, uh, people have tried to find this out in the 1960s uh, when, 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 when I uh, started. Uh, they are still trying to find out uh, this. There is the field of computational neuroscience, which tries to uh, um, find out um, uh, by computer simulation that there is this artificial intelligence you know, which has made uh, large progress in the in the last few years in in, in um, understanding, uh, say, problems like recognition of objects and faces. You know, or uh, even controlling um, uh, controlling a car. There are many interesting areas. You know, and um, uh, it may. Just also be a little bit matter of chance, you know, what you get in contact with and what is able to capture your your attention. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, it's been a great opportunity to us and I would like really to thank you, Professor Nair, for your kindness, for your knowledge and also for your clear, deep interest in the future of the new generations which is extremely important for all of us. So really, thank you very much. And you made a complex subject easy to understand. And you made our day a little bit more normal in this emergency we are living in, especially now in Italy, because we are planning the future, which is the future of our students. So really, thank you very much. It is invaluable. It has no value to us. Uh, really, thank you very much. Well, thank you for giving me the chance to explain uh, things to young people. And I think this is a very important thing to uh, actually um, convey the flavor of what it means to be a scientist, you know, in particular for young students who are about to decide for themselves what they, uh, how they should plan their, their lives, you know. And, um, just to conclude, let me state that, um, of course, uh, life as a scientist is very competitive. I mean, you you want to be the first, you know, to uh, find out something, and uh, as this depends on this is also depends on the success in your career. But science uh, scientists have the privilege uh, of uh, doing what they want, uh, following their own interest, doing their own thing, 
and being paid by the government. Forse la posso tradurre, ma ha detto gli scienziati hanno il privilegio di fare quello che desiderano veramente e vengono anche pagati per questo. Uh, thank you very much. And now uh, I'm giving uh, the scene to professor Marco Costanzi, e quindi il professor Costanzi chiuderà questo collegamento raccontandoci anche gli aspetti scientifici che la rete cura e i prossimi appuntamenti. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Flaminia, grazie ovviamente a tutte le persone che lavorano nella rete per far vivere ovviamente la rete e per far vivere la rete bisogna far vivere la cultura e nel, nel caso specifico la, la cultura scientifica. È un onore ovviamente per noi avere un premio Nobel come ospite eh, in ambito scientifico e infatti oggi abbiamo trattato della biofisica, eh, quindi un, un processo molto eh, diciamo, importante e soprattutto di, di ampia ricerca. Detto questo eh, ringraziamo ovviamente Flaminia che eh, con molta maestria ha gestito questo, questo, e moderato questo, questo, questo bellissimo incontro e discussione e confronto con il premio Nobel. E sono qui per ricordarvi che la nostra rete ovviamente sta investendo molto nell'ambito scientifico e quindi grazie anche a Flaminia e la collaborazione con la Fondazione Umberto Veronesi, il Policlinico di Borgo Roma, il 25 di marzo avremo un importante convegno sulle leucemie giovanili insieme ad Atmor. Eh, quindi eh, temi importanti di ricerca scientifico, scientifica nell'ambito proprio sanitario, nell'ambito della malattia, quindi dove la scienza può dare veramente un risvolto di speranza per un futuro veramente migliore che possa aiutare le persone proprio in ambito anche sanitario. Un ringraziamento ovviamente va a tutte le scuole che hanno partecipato, ai nostri studenti di Copernico Pasoli, soprattutto eh, al liceo eh, Maffei di Verona, che insomma in sinergia abbiamo organizzato e, e sviluppato questi, questi importantissimi temi di ampia ricerca scientifica. Con questo possiamo concludere la nostra diretta e alla prossima. Arrivederci a tutti. Arrivederci. Arrivederci.